You're listening to Science Coast with Mallory Havens and Chris White. And today our guests are Sarah Pariseau and Andrew Lenahan. And today we're going to be talking about libraries. Yay! And- <laughs> No, libraries are cool. Yeah, I that sounded libraries. sarcastic. I was not sarcastic. <laughs> it was felt from my soul. That was, that was the very response that we always get. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, librarians have always been held in high respect in my household. And and it's I'm not saying that sarcastically. I'm saying it quite quite sincerely. Um, books are valued. and uh, but But what we've observed over the course of my lifetime uh, is that libraries have actually evolved quite a bit. When I was a kid, it was just this, you know, this uh, house. Actually, it was a house because I grew up in a small town, and they didn't have a separate building. They just bought somebody's house and converted it into a library and filled each of the rooms with shelves and put books on all the shelves. And we were supposed to be quiet, and you went and you got your books, and then you left and you went home. Today, libraries are very different things. Um, They can actually be loud. And this notion of, oh, you have to be quiet when you're in a library just isn't true anymore. Yeah. So as director of libraries, Andrew, I think that it would be a great conversation to have. Um, how have libraries changed in your lifetime? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I will just start with kind of our basic thinking about librarianship and libraries. And that goes back to the German philosopher, Jürgen Habermas, and his notion of the public sphere. So, you know, if you're familiar with Habermas and like, his thinking and work that he did out of the Frankfurt School. I am not. They... <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, no, he, he, he envisions what he calls the public sphere. And the public sphere is kind of the idealized version of a civilized community in that you have all of your community necessities in a certain proximity to all the residents within that community. And so you've got your fire, your police, your infrastructure, uh, people that take care of your houses and and the roads and the streets and all that fun stuff. And then also in there is the library. And, And Habermas thought that the library, because it is the envisioned area of the centralization of thought for a community, that it sits at the center and it, and it, and it is tasked with being a reflection of the community as the community grows and evolves. And so from the very notion of his thinking about this, the libraries were were to be thought of not as stagnant institutions or stagnant spaces. And that, and, and as we think about it here and kind of how our staff and, and members of the library here think about it is that we grow and move and evolve with the community's needs around us. And so to your question, to your point about how libraries are evolving, they're, alive, they're evolving because we don't need the classical spaces that we needed prior to the internet revolutions in the late 90s and early 2000s in that we don't need set computer areas that only do very minimal kind of computing work. We don't need tons of bookshelves because the majority of information is in print. We don't need uh, exclusively very quiet areas because the library is only seen as the place where people go to be very quiet. We need spaces that meet the demands of the community that we exist within now. And so the community that we exist within now is highly collaborative. They are extraordinarily social. They are using media and um, disseminating media and ingesting media that's mostly online now. And so they want meeting spaces. They want facilities and um, different types of resources that meet those types of demands that they see within their community right now. And so as a library, it's incumbent upon us to meet those demands. And so that's why you see libraries changing to more open floor plans and removing the immediate access to books and redefining that space to meet those demands of the community. Uh, The books were there, the reference collections were there, if you think specifically about academic libraries, which is my kind of strong point and and background is is working only in academic libraries. You know, we had gigantic reference collections. We had huge rooms dedicated to nothing but reference books that couldn't leave that room, right? I don't know if you all, I'm sure all of you remember Mm -hmm. being in your studies, right? Yeah, that uh, you could look at them, you could touch them, but if you walked out of a door, you'd have somebody chasing you, (laughs) screaming at you. (laughs) Uh, But those are gone because a lot of those references now are online and they can be updated more readily and less expensively than what the collection had prior done. And so, you know, you think about like encyclopedia collections, right? Tons and tons of encyclopedias were published for decades. And that goes out the window as we start to put those online, as we start Mm -hmm. to access information and build information infrastructure online that does the exact same thing for much less cost, for much less overhead. And then that leaves libraries thinking, 
what are we going to do with this space? And so then we look around and say, well, we need a podcast studio or we need a 3D printing station or we need a recording booth or we need open seating or we need collaborative spaces or we need individual study pods because students after the pandemic don't want to be around other students and they want to study silently. And so it's, it's things like, it's things like that's, that's where our job is now today. It's not book centric or purchasing centric. It's, it's really envisioning what the space needs to become and how it constantly changes. Yeah, but in theory, that's true. But many of the reference uh, uh, journals are now sitting behind paywalls. So this idea that it's readily available online just isn't true. Very true. Yeah. yeah. And to be the devil's advocate, can you go too far in the other direction of moving away from print material, spaces of contemplation, things like that, towards the collaborative neighborhood front, you know, front room, if you will? Yeah. Um, I think you always could. I think one of the challenges, especially especially within academic libraries, is the constant balancing act of the amount of resources that we're providing in different types of mediums or formats. And I think that that's a big challenge. And that's a struggle. If you talk to a lot of academic librarians, especially directors or people, heads of units and things like that within larger academic libraries, there is a constant conversation happening because there is this requirement of balance that is increasingly challenging. And so we, we can't, we won't, I don't think, go one way or the other. And that's, I think, one of the issues is that from the outside perspective, people say, well, you've canceled. So I'll just pick on Coast because it's Coast centric podcast today. <laughs> so we'll get chemistry professors that will come in and say, you've canceled all of our publications in print. This is ridiculous. I can't believe that you've done this. How are my students going to access it? We say, well, you can access it online. Uh, well, everything now is going to go to electronic sources. Well, not everything's going to go to electronic sources, right? And so the, so the, the goal here to kind of get back to the question is w the balance sits within what information um, is more readily needed and again, what information is more easily compiled and collected and stored in books versus electronic formats? And who's using that information and how are they using that information? And so I think, again, it just goes back to this constant balancing act that we find ourselves in. Well, I think the academic library looks very different than like the community library. Yeah. Because like when I walk into my community's library, there's like the children's section full of books and other things. And then there's you see many more printed materials in a community library rather than an academic one because they serve different purposes. And most academic publications are available online, even if it's behind a paywall. I personally try to publish everything open access, even though it costs more because um, I write it in grants too. Like, cause you have to talk about how you'll disseminate your information. I always say I'll pay the open access fee, but um, you know, I think that, what distinguishes different types of libraries? So I know there's community, there's institutional. I know the national library, <laughs> but like, <laughs> what other kind of in the presidential libraries? But like, what kind of libraries are there? Yeah, there's a number of different kinds. Um, they're generally categorized in our profession in three different ways. So there's academics, publics, schools, and then you have a subcategory within the publics that is a special library. It's a, kind of a hybrid between academic libraries and school libraries, and those are called special libraries. And those are typically your libraries that are in corporations. Oh. So like ComEd has their own library, right? I did they not have a, know that. Yeah, they have a staff of librarians yeah. that do nothing but they research. They have historians on staff as well. Yeah. 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 And so To make sure our electricity is properly appreciated <laughs> in historical context? <laughs> no. So, it, people get requests, and they have stuff on their website, and they write press releases and all that. Yeah. yeah they have a whole archives and everything. Yeah. It's very strange. Yeah. yeah. that uh, Good for them, but I just <laughs> did not know. Career options. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a very demanding librarianship career um, because typically what they do is they work at the behest of the lobbyists and the the legal wings of these corporations. And oh, so a lot of the time yeah. what it is, is um, they are asking for, oh, we are going to meet with so-and-so politician or congressperson, and we need this amount of information about this legislative act that we want to get across, pull up all this information within the next 24 hours while we're en route to Washington, D.C. and make it available to us. And so they're very kind of demanding. They can be very demanding jobs. So you've got- That sounds really fun. Years. Yeah, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's not the good. <laughs> I have friends that do that and uh, they love it, right? It's it's uh, the cool thing about librarianship is that you get to have different uh, people that love libraries at different levels. Like I would never want to be a corporate librarian. I think it's much too much of a demanding uh, position. Um, I like the fluidity that 
academia involves. Yeah. So what about archives? Are those going to be like the last repository, like the keepers of the flame of the old style library? I don't know. Uh, that's a great question. I yeah. think even with archives, so some of the we're doing here that's um, in line with what a lot of other academic libraries are doing is opening up our archives because that our, gives me chills. Uh, yeah. It, it, bad <laughs> chills. Well, <laughs> well, but think about it this way. Don't, don't get, don't get bad chills yet. Think about it this way is that, you know, it, as we've thought about libraries, you know, kind of going back to your original question, Chris, well, what has changed about them? Well, they become more open. You know, the other thing that I didn't mention is that all of this led to the opening up of libraries, right? Even though they were public, you think about your own experiences and how many of your experiences involved a majority of those books at your libraries when you're growing up being behind restricted areas. Like you had to go back behind a desk maybe, or you had to ask for that book to be retrieved for you. And you, you had to get someone to get you a material or to help you with a the computer. There were all these kind of um, gatekeepers in place to kind of help direct you or retrieve things for you. And as the libraries evolved, that's all gone away as we've opened up our collections and things like that. Archives are the last area that have this conversation happening. And it is because a lot of people are hesitant about this in that there's a multitude of issues related to that, right? Mm -hmm. If we open up archives, we're potentially unearthing um, uh, secrets of different institutions. We're potentially opening up sensitive materials. We're potentially making things available that maybe shouldn't be available at a wide spectrum of, of audiences. Like what? Um, you know, I think people think of, I mean, I will say this, Lewis University, to my knowledge and understanding of our archives, doesn't have any uh, very kind of juicy, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, this salacious very information. Harry Potter archives. <laughs> yeah. But there are, like you think about it, you know, like, well, think about the national archives, right? I mean, there's a number of governmental secrets. There's a number of, right. of sensitive pieces of information that are in our archives. And I think to a certain extent, every archives has that to mm -hmm. varying degrees. Like you might find a faculty member that taught here in the 70s that had some issue not getting tenure. And those documents are in our files, right? Now, that might not be salacious to any of us, but that might be something that that person doesn't want to openly shared if it gets digitized and made available on the web. I see. Right. Yeah. So okay. those are so those are considerations that we have to make with the materials. So are so, Lewis's library archives in like have my employment records? We have um <laughs> Yeah, well, well, we have personnel information in terms of tenure appointments and any types of professional development that gets done by any faculty. Whoa. Yeah. 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 Did not. Well, I know that we're talking about a digital repository, digital yeah. commons yeah. and all of that happening. And I knew my information would be available there, but I just didn't. That seems like a file in an HR cabinet. I'm surprised <laughs> that falls under the guise of a I apparently don't know what libraries are. What are libraries, Andrew? <laughs> 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 to be clear, you, you, the details of your employment <laughs> and, your, and your personal information. I feel like I need my I own. I think that's like our address. We, we, no, we don't need, like, that is not in there. That gets put into HR files. But eventually what happens as part of that process, at least here, is that a lot of that information then gets stored in our archives. So that makes room for HR to do more um record keeping that's present record keeping, not past record keeping. I see. But but when I say tenure appointments, I literally mean just the letter that you receive saying you have been awarded tenure. Yeah, they have to destroy right. your files at a certain point. <laughs> right. Yeah. Never fear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's not in there, Mallory? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Consistent <laughs> employment. <laughs> but okay. So, so yeah, so, going back to your point, why are you scared? Why are, why does it give so you the bad So you're feels? talking about digitization, which I don't have yeah. a problem with. I didn't quite know what you mean by the opening of the archives because background so i have a background in history you go to the archives you put in a request for archives they give you gloves they give you like a whole setup you're barely allowed to touch things you're only allowed to have pencils there's an old lady behind a desk staring at you the whole time and it's because you're handling george washington's notebooks right all right so when you say opening i'm like is there going to be just like you can walk off a shelf, <laughs> take that off the shelf go look at if you're talking about digitizing that's a totally different story, and that I can 100% support. So yeah. I think it's just definitions here. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I apologize for the, the lack of clarity there. But I will say, to your point, I personally want to open ours to where there's standing up appointment windows so the students can come and look at things with gloves, with necessary protective gear, um, because I think it's important for young people especially to touch yeah. our physical ephemera from the past, mm -hmm. you know, Um there's a couple of professors here within the first year writing program that do a lot of research right now with using archival materials and these students that are working with it. I cannot tell you like the excitement that you see in their eyes holding old yearbooks or holding old newspapers and going, oh, my gosh, this is what happened on campus. And uh -huh. I think that that 
activity without getting too weird about it, <laughs> the, <laughs> the physicality of holding something that's historical. Oh no, I, I agree. Is is very important. So that's so I think that that's also something we talk about opening it. But those examples are it wouldn't be open like you think of general open stacks. Yeah, it would be appointment windows and people would be monitoring the area. So I guess my like confusion that. is my experience yeah. is that was the experience is that it was right. open. You could just go in and be like, I want this. And they're like, OK, yeah. you got to lock out all, all your stuff there. We're taking all of your devices. You right. can't do anything. But it was open. Mm hmm. So I guess yeah. I'm I'm surprised to learn that that's not always the case. Yeah, it's not. Uh, there's a number of them that aren't open that that aren't even accessible. So if you go to different wow. historical institutions, yeah. Mm. yeah. So I have a quick question for you, Andrew. Um, I remember when I was a kid, a big part of my grade school education was library science and the card catalog mm. and the whole idea of actually being brought down to the library and shown, all right, well, this is the fiction section. This is the nonfiction section. This is where you look for this. This is where you look for this. With the evolution of libraries, are grade school kids still being taught library science? Yeah. In terms of organization of information, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, because I'm not sure what the current state is of, of school libraries, especially like elementary school libraries. You because know, we, we yeah. assume that when something's online that, oh, just of course, everybody understands it. And we talk about, you know, the younger people being digital natives. But when you actually scratch the surface, you find out that there's it's the, the knowledge is not deep. Mm -hmm. And if we don't actively educate the next generation about what libraries are and what information is available and how to access it yeah. and just assume that they know how to access it online. We're, we're, we're doing them a disservice. I know as a child, because I am a nerd, I would give up recess in elementary school to help refile the library books. Me too. I, <gasps> yes! I, uh, I, went, See, I, I was would, playing Oregon Trail instead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was actually forced to go out on recess because I, I initially would say, hey, can I go to the library instead of going outside for recess? And, and at first the teachers were like, oh, yes, of course, go read books. And then I would do it every single day. And at some point the teacher was like, no, Chris, you have to go outside. <laughs> no, this I was is our like, gossip <laughs> time, Chris. You need to yes. leave. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I know the Dewey Decimal System. I got this. Yeah. I'll put this. And now everything's away. Library of Congress. Yeah. 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 Do um do you still have microfiche? Is that going away? No, uh, it's not going away. It gets used less and less. So mm. microfiche and microfilm get produced less and less. Um because most of that information now has been digitized and yeah. made available yeah. online through databases. And so the kind of last holdouts of that not surprisingly, is our federal government. And so the United States Federal Government Repository and the GPO, the Governmental Printing Office, still publishes in fiche and film. So as a repository, Lewis University is a governmental repository. So we're a designated location where this information gets delivered. Um, so we get large boxes of fiche still of all the bills and everything that are available. Oh, that's kind of cool. In, yeah. But nobody uses them, right? And so this is the other thing, too, where... Why would you sit at a fiche reader and slide little pieces of microfilm fiche into a reader mm -hmm. rather than sitting and looking at the entire government printing office, which is online, and just searching through all those bills? That amazed me when I went to D.C. that you could just go down in the basement of Congress and get printed copies of all the bills and just be mm -hmm. like, I'm taking – and I took, like, stacks and stacks. <laughs> and I'm like, why did I do this? <laughs> and I recycled them. You were emboldened. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I have always been a nerd. But, well – we're out of time. So you have been listening to Science Coast. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are the speaker's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Lewis University. The material and information presented here is for general information purposes only. The Lewis University name and all forms and abbreviations are the property of its owner, and its use does not imply a endorsement of or opposition to any specific organization, product, or service. This podcast was produced in the WLRA podcast studios at Lewis University. Visit lewisu.edu for more information about Lewis University. I'm Mallory Havens with Chris White, Sarah Pariso, and Andrew Linehan. Thanks.